Hi, I'm Andy, and this is a video about uh, a game that I plan to um, uh, build uh, and, and have working on Android, but which is currently not based on any Android-specific stuff at all. So the game's called Rabbit Escape. You can see it um, playing out in this window here. Um, and my plan for it really is that um, it, it's supposed to be something that's a lot like Lemmings, uh, and like Pingu's, which is a, a clone of it, um, but something that work, that should work really well on a screen uh, controlled uh, by touch. Lemmings is one of my favourite games from the past, uh, and uh, um, I feel it's worthy of a, a tribute. I'm sure it won't be as good as Lemmings, but I'll do my best. So, if you're not familiar with what Lemmings is, it's uh, it's a game where some little guys come out of an entrance, as these ones have come out of this entrance up here, and they wander about and you have to control them by giving them various abilities to get them into the exit, and they, in this the exit is just over here. So as you can see, um, the graphics and stuff are not um, complete yet, but uh, some of the mechanics are in place. You can see the little rabbits running around, and if I place a little ability for them, oops, that's the wrong place for it. If I place a little ability uh, for them, that will allow them to um, dig through a wall, then they should uh, make their way into the exit. There's a little rabbit digging through the wall, and there it goes. Another little dig, and then into the exit. Um, and uh, it says you won. So you can see the mechanics are in place, um, if not all the graphics. In fact, it's complaining here because I haven't drawn an animation yet for the rabbit going into the exit. Anyway, this uh, this game is. Um, written in Java, and that UI that you saw there is a Java Swing UI. Swing is part of Java, so it's kind of uh, my default choice when I'm writing Java stuff. Generally, I wouldn't choose Java as my first choice language, but um, if I'm writing stuff on Android, um, I would choose it. I also use it uh, a lot at work, so I'm pretty familiar with it, even if it isn't, wouldn't be my first choice. So um, that makes it uh, reasonably easy for me to use. What I want to do in this video is talk a little bit about how I'm structuring uh, the project, and in particular, how I'm trying to make it more convenient to work with than, than previous Android projects um, I've worked on. So in the past, I've, um, I've made a couple of things on Android, and I've found that I was quite tied into the way Android does things. And in particular, when I've written code that's really nothing to do with Android, um, I've ended up having to run it, only being able to run it, on my phone. Um, and that includes things like little utility classes and uh, unit tests for them. I found it very inconvenient um, that I was completely tied to even running the, to the unit tests on my phone or, or in an emulator. So um, I thought this time I'll do, I'll do it a bit better. So what I've done is completely not, completely ignored Android. I've written a game without it. Except, uh, except it depends what you mean by that. So actually when we go into some of the graphic stuff, you'll see that I've tried to make stuff kind of ready to be converted to Android. Um, so I'm at the point now where I'm nearly ready to start actually getting it working on Android. So what I thought I'd do is do a little tour of um, how it's structured now, and then we can have the little tension moment where we find out how much of my ideas are actually going to work when I try and make it work on Android. So first of all, if you want to follow along with um, a Rabbit Escape, or you want to contribute, um, uh, welcome contributions. It's an open source project. It's on GitHub under Andy Balaam slash Rabbit Escape. Um, the GitHub page claims there's only a text interface, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, but actually, there's a proper swing interface, as you've seen. This GitHub's up to date with everything I do whenever I make changes. Um, the code will go up on here. I do warn you, if you if you do contribute to the project, I do plan to uh, sell it for money on uh, the Android store, so if you object to that, uh, don't contribute. But um, it's it's completely open source. I plan to have the levels and uh, graphics be under a, a Creative Commons license that means other people can't exploit them commercially, uh, and the code will be under GPL version 2, so you can, do, you can uh, exploit that commercially to your heart's content. Um, I would welcome contributions, and as we go through this, we'll probably um, you'll probably get an idea 
um, of where contributions might help. So I've split up the um, the parts of the code into four main parts, and there will be a, at least one more, which will be the Android part. So the parts I've broken up into the engine, which is basically stuff that is unrelated to graphics, is to do with the logic of the game. Rendering, which is um, stuff related to graphics and drawing, but which is not specific to a particular type of UI. Um, and then uh, stuff to do with the swing UI, and stuff to do with the text UI. So one of my goals in, in of this video is to demonstrate to you that quite a lot of the logic, even in a game, which um, some people think is quite hard to unit test, quite a lot of this stuff can be tested uh, in a way that genuinely helps you uh, know that your code works, not just kind of um, ticking boxes, getting code coverage, but it actually um, shows you how the code works. So once you've downloaded um, the code from GitHub, you can do a make test, and assuming you've got all the right dependencies and stuff, um, it will build all the artifacts needed and uh, and all the code, and then it will run all the tests. And you can see there's quite a few, uh, including a lot that are to do with the logic of the game that I'll go into in a bit. While we're on the command line, let's also have a look at um, uh, the, the command line interface. So um, this this view shows you the same level that we looked at before. Uh, in the swing UI, but now running in the text UI. So you may ask yourself, why on earth would you make a uh, text-based UI for a game, apart from the fact that it's obviously cool. Um, and the fact that it's obviously cool was definitely part of my motivation. You can see the little rabbits walking around there, by the way, if you um, if you squint at it and you learn to read the matrix. You can see the little rabbits moving around. So basically this is like an ASCII art. Uh, UI for this game, and uh, yeah, other than the fact that it's really cool and I like it, um, another reason for this text-based UI is it's really helped me write uh, useful and good uh, unit tests, so I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, another way you can run this game uh, is on the command line, but interactively, so here it pauses at every time step, uh, and you press return to make it move on a time step, and in this mode you can control things, you can actually place uh, items in the world. Uh, my plan for that, which I haven't implemented yet, is that um, possibly uh, I will use this mode, to, for especially for particularly hard levels, to um, record solutions to levels um, uh, and then play and then uh, play them back in this mode and check that uh, they can actually, that, that they are solutions. And that, So I can kind of unit test my levels as well um, by checking that they're soluble, uh, by providing a solution and checking that you end up um, uh, having saved the required number of rabbits um, if you if you make those particular moves at those particular times. So, um, what's my point? My point is um, this game is so not tied to Android that it's not even tied to any type of UI at all. It's um, in principle completely um, runnable on the command line which just uh, demonstrates that the logic separated out between um, different types of display. Um, also, a note that I'm using make. Underneath, I'm also using ant, uh, because ant provides some, some things like the JUnit task and the Java JavaAC task that it would be annoying to write yourself. Um, uh, probably I could do better. I was. It's a shortcut to use ant. Really, I'd like to use make without ant. I find ant... Um, uh, goes against everything I believe in and like, uh, and make uh, really is really quite good. So um, where should we go next? While we're here and looking at this ASCII art, let's have a look at uh, uh, how we write levels. So I do plan to write a level editor for this game. I think any game without a level editor is basically half a game. Uh, any game with levels, I mean. Um, so I definitely plan to write a graphical level editor, but in the meantime, you can design levels by just doing a bit of ASCII art yourself. And you can see it's not too um, not too intimidating. You basically there are, there's information you can put at the top, which has got a colon and then and then certain keywords that 
uh, that it understands this is basically the number of bashes, the number of diggers, the number of bridges. Those are different abilities you can give to the rabbits. So ten times you can drop a token that allows a rabbit to bash, which means dig sideways. Uh, and it'll, you can also set things like how many rabbits um, are going to come out of the entrance at all. And also, eventually there will have goals like um, how many rabbits you need to save and so on. So any sort of um, information like that can go in a line starting with a colon. And then the rest of this file um, is ASCII art uh, representing the level. Uh, so basically a hash means a, a block of solid wall and then a, a, a forward slash means a slope uh, up and to the right and a backslash means a slope up and to the left. Um, and there's symbols for all the other types of things you can have <clears throat> in the game at the moment. So this is our level editor. You can edit this text file as long as you've got a monospace text editor. Um, it's fairly easy to see uh, what your level is going to come out like. So I've found it quite convenient so far writing levels. So again, um, uh, why am I telling you this? Because I think it's it, it's a good approach where you can have um, a file format that's so straightforward to understand that you don't even you need a level editor. Uh, that's great. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look at some of the code. So, um, in the engine, um, this stuff is completely unrelated to any type of UI. So, um, uh, all of it, pretty much all of it, is amenable to being tested. So, um, we've got uh, the main logic. So, we've got things like a world, which just represents where the blocks are and things like that. Let's have a look at that. Um, and uh, yeah, and a world holds on to things like where all the blocks are, where all the rabbits are, where all the other things are, uh, and it also has this concept of changes that are about to happen to it. So while stuff's going on, um, rather than changing the blocks themselves when we're digging through blocks, what we do is make a an entry in this changes class, and then in the next time step, um, uh, things actually get changed. So that I means that controls that process, so things don't change mid time step. They only change at the end, because obviously if you drop a token um, that could happen at any time whenever you click, which could be in the middle of a time step. So I should point out that um, the, the way this game works is very discreet. So just as you can see from the the, the textual um, uh, representation of it, uh, that the fact that those um, letters move one square at a time is not just a coincidence, it's not just a, an approximation of where they are, they actually only ever are um, either in one block and then the next time step they're in the next block and then in the next time step they're at the next block. So the physics in this game is incredibly simple. It's basically a state machine uh, which goes through fixed state transitions. There's no simulation of, um, of how far they've uh, moved this time step based on their speed or anything like that. They just move one block or or they don't move or they move something. When they're falling they move two blocks in a time step but they um, it's all completely discrete. Uh, which is very different from the original Lemmings game and has caused me problems in that I have to do a lot of uh, animations for each different type of movement they can do, like move up uh, diagonally one block to the right and so on and so on. Um, but it does mean the actual logic of the game is quite straightforward and the reason, the main reason behind it is that on a phone you don't want to have to be too accurate with your, your, with your touching. Um, so I want it to all exist on a grid. That's the way I've chosen to make it nice and straightforward to to use in that format. So that's the motivation for it, apart from the fact that it, it appeals to me, that it's, it lives on a grid. Um, and the reason, actually, why I chose rabbits is because rabbits do little hops, so they can hop from one square on the grid to the next. Um, okay, so where are we going with this? So the, um, the game loop uh, basically um, uh, runs run through what happens and uh, each... Oh, can I find that? Um, maybe not right now. So basically uh, the rabbits themselves uh, get... Um, go through um, this state transition every time step they get told to do something. So the, the steps for that, the way that works is that you ask the rabbit to calculate what its new state is going to be, 
and then you tell it to behave based on that new state. So the state is basically what's used to decide what kind of animation plays. So if you're walking to the right, you're, if your state is walking to the right, then the animation for a rabbit walking to the right gets played. And then step means uh, actually move the rabbit to the next place on the right. And as part of the setup of a rabbit, you have all these different abilities, like the ability to exit at the exit, the ability to fall, the ability to bash, the ability to dig or bridge or walk. And these behaviors kind of control their own um, well, whether or not they happen. So if you go into the falling ability, uh, there's this behave thing which basically checks um, is this behavior going to be the thing that, that determines the behavior of the rabbit or not? So if, um, I oh know, sorry, it's new state that, sorry, that does that determination. So basically, um, what you do is you check whether there's a gap underneath this rabbit. And if so, you return a state saying, uh, that the rabbit's falling. And there's all these different ways of falling. You can fall onto a slope, um, or you can fall, uh, to your death if you hit the bottom. Um, and, uh, yeah, so if these, if you return a state that the rabbit's going to be in, that means you've taken control of, uh, that rabbit's behavior. And if you return null, that means, uh, you haven't taken control of that rabbit's behavior. So you're, for example, you're standing on a flat piece. So the falling state is then not going to, um, determine the rabbit's behavior. Probably it will be walking or bashing or bridging or, or digging or something else. So that's the kind of overview of the logic. Now, but rather than testing these classes individually, um, the style that I've chosen to test, which I feel is the right level uh, I wish to test this stuff, is um, inside. It is at the level at the level of uh, a whole world that you you step through and you check that the state of that world is how you expect it to be. So let's look at test falling. So here's where we can see a bit of ASCII art come back in. So rather than that just being a user interface, it, in a way it's a kind of natural language of this game. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm calling this create world function, which makes a world out of ASCII art. So these the uh, the quotes are part of the Java code, and then the blank spaces in between them are part of the, the world. So the world is mostly blank, and there's a rabbit up here, and then there's some blocks down at the bottom. And we tell it to do a time step. And then we assert that the, the falling behavior has happened. So the rabbit has moved two steps down in that time step. So this is our assertion. It uses the Hamcrest style, assert that style. Um, but basically we render the world back into text and we assert that it's equal to this text. So the, the rabbit's moved down one. So you can see that, um, in a way I'm testing at quite a high level. I'm not testing the methods of classes. Um, I'm not even testing the behavior of a whole class on its own. I'm actually testing uh, this whole behavior um, of a rabbit and of a world um, with a rabbit in it. So um, you might think that's too high level. Personally, I think it perfectly is perfectly the right level for this problem um, because I can write unit tests that are so obviously right. Okay, so you can just look at this and I wish they were lined up with each other. But anyway, you can look at this and you can see, look, well, there's a rabbit there. And next time step, the rabbit should have fallen down there. Um, and to me, that's the definition of a good uh, unit test. You can look at it and immediately know it's right. Um, and then there's all kinds of other tests. So this little F here mean, is, um, it means that I'm able to illustrate the states uh, that the rab that the objects are in as well as as well as where they are so this in this time i i just rendered it with uh where the rabbit is but here i'm rendering what state it's in as well which means a little f appears below it i passed in a true here to say give me the states so we can say create the world and then we can say well the state of it is that the rabbit's going to fall one and then the next time step it has indeed only fallen one so you can see there's all kinds of other cases. So you, uh, this one just checks that you can fall. If you do fall four squares, you don't die. So that means you're not dead when you get to the bottom. Whereas if you fall six squares, um, do a few steps here. And when you get to the bottom, you land and then you splat. So the state of the state of you, so your location is there. And notice there's no time step here. This is just asking me to tell me the state of this rabbit. The state of the rabbit is X, which means it, 
the, it's black. So in the in the tech, in the graphical world, that would be an animation of a rabbit splatting. In the text world, that's represented by an X. So um, notice that even in some sense, we're testing the animation code here, even in this text form. So we're not testing that the animation looks right, but we're testing that that animation will get played. You know, this X here basically corresponds exactly to playing the animation of a rabbit dying. And then the next time step is gone. So we've got tests for all these different uh, behaviors, for example, building bridges. These brackets here are, are bridges, and then it gets to the top and falls off. Uh, I got bored of writing tests for the left, people, rabbits going left and rabbits going right, so I combined them into a single test, which is probably really awful, but kind of works for me, because these two, these two cases are identical, but they need to be tested individually, really. Um, okay, and then you can, yeah, all kinds of places, different places where you can build a bridge, and then a test, for example, for digging through uh, a block when there's only, when it's only one uh, deep or digging down through several blocks. When you dig down through several blocks, you have to fall down into the hole and then dig again and then fall down and then dig again and so on. Uh, all kinds of exciting behaviors. So the point of all this is, when I introduce a new behavior, uh, for example, uh, floating uh, uh, or climbing up walls, up vertical walls, or something like that, uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be messing with this kind of tricky logic here, which is uh, which behavior comes first in this list uh, influences which one takes control. It's quite difficult to get the order of that right. And you'll notice here that I, the falling one has to know about the digging one. So basically, you, your falling behavior is slightly different based on whether or not you're digging, I think, or something like that. So I had to do some little gymnastics here. So if I tested each of these individual classes, um, I would know that they behave how I expect them. but is that useless? It's not useless, but the really hard part of this problem is actually testing this interaction of these behaviours. So by testing at that level, um, uh, I'm much more likely to catch the real kinds of problems that you come across. Uh, what it, by testing at this level, it also means when I'm playing the game and I notice something's gone wrong, I can very quickly just do a little bit of ASCII art for the situation that happened, um, and then make an assertion about what should have happened, and then once that test passes, um, I'm happy that I've, I've solved that problem, and uh, hopefully it's understandable to someone else looking at it later. And once these tests are run every single time I make a change, I know that when I've introduced a new behavior, um, I haven't broken any of the stuff that I, um, I'd made assertions about before. So yeah, I think uh, what I'm saying is uh, the logic of games can be tested, and this level of testing, uh, or something like it, seems like a good level to me. So what else do I want to show you? Uh, there's other, there's, there's quite a lot of opinionated stuff in this code that I won't bother showing you now, but I've got certain opinions about how exceptions should work. I don't think they should contain messages. I think they should, um, there should be one class for everything that could happen and then some layer higher up turns that into text. Um, I've got some opinions about how translation should happen. Um, if you saw the video I did about, um, hierarchical menus, the, the expression of the menu system of this game is um, is expressed in a kind of completely um, platform system independent way, similar to what we did in that video. Uh, so basically, there's a, there's an initial menu with a start game and about demo and quit buttons, and then inside start game you choose a level set, and then inside the level set you can actually choose one of the levels. So that's expressed here in RabbitScape Engine, which is which is unrelated with any type of UI. Uh, it's also um, there's also tests for that, so all of this stuff here is all um, related to that uh, menu system, and none of it uh, is at all related to UIs. What does need to be in here is the ASCII art bit. So we've got um, uh, the, all this stuff to do with turning a world into text and turning text into a world, um, and depending which you see is more important, either we got the unit test version of that free by building the level creation code or vice versa. Um, but it has to be uh, has to be bidirectional for the unit tests to work and also it just feels that what it ought to be bidirectional. Um, I also built uh, various utilities, something that I think every project should have. It's something that is as close as possible to the native file system libraries of your language but is swappable in for a fake file system in your tests. 
So in this case, I've done something that can read and write files, get out a file as a bunch of as an array of lines, check whether a file exists, and where I need new stuff, I'll add it gradually. And I've implemented that that as a real file system, which hopefully doesn't contain, contain too much code. If your real file system contains too much code, you know that's code you can never unit test, so that's bad. So this stuff needs to be as um, as uh, minimal as possible um, in here. I've also written a load of utilities. I don't like uh, dependencies, so I've written. I do like writing functional style code, so I've written a lot of functional style functions like map and, and uh, uh, things that let you iterate through a string and join up strings together and all kinds of things like that. Um, utilities that I I think sh should be part of the language but aren't. Rather than going and finding some uh, some excellent Apache library or something like that, I've written them myself and I've written a unit test for them now. You could argue I've done that because I just love doing stuff like that, um, or, or perhaps there's a good reason for it, like dependencies are horrible. Um, so we've had a look at the, the testing for the logic of the game, there's also lots of tests for all these utilities and stuff like that, but you know that, that's uh, not rocket science and tests for that menu stuff and things like that. So that is the engine, uh, and uh, as much as possible of this game is in there, and uh, um, uh, it's completely independent uh, from what device you're running on. And I hope that it will it will go into the Android world without any modifications at all. I think I think it probably won't because I think I've used features from Java Seven that may not be available in the Android versions that I want to support. So I may have to go back and change some nice code into horrible old-fashioned code. But we'll see about that. Uh, let's have a quick look at the rendering code. So um, basically, again, the same story. I've tried to abstract out um, stuff that uh, that I know I'm going to need to do on every graphical UI. So in the text UI, most of this stuff is not used, um, but every graphical UI is going to basically need to do things like um, get get hold of images and draw them on the screen at, at certain coordinates. So, for example, this renderer is um, cross-platform. What it takes in is um, a a so-called canvas, which is an interface uh, which I've tried to make like the Android canvas, um, but actually the only method I need on it is the ability to draw a bitmap. Um, and then in the swing world, something implements this canvas interface, um, which is obviously it's got to be a class of mine because it's implementing an interface of mine, and we're here, we're in Java here, not Go. Um, it would be really nice if uh, if it, that, that wasn't the way it was, but anyway, that's the way it is. So we've written this class called Swing Bitmap Canvas, which um, uh, which extends Swing Canvas, and Swing Canvas implements this Canvas interface, and uh, it implements Draw Bitmap, and in this case, it just does it using um, this Graphics 2D object. Uh, so in this case, Graphics 2D is pretty similar to. Uh, the Android canvas, so you can, uh, it's pretty easy to make this abstraction. Anyway, the point is, so there, by the way, I've jumped into the swing specific code, so let's jump back into the general, generalized code. So anyway, the point is, by, both swing and Android, and probably most other systems, will have something a bit like a canvas. I've specifically tried to make, um, to make my generic graphics operations work on classes that are a bit like the Android or we'll work on interfaces that are a bit like the Android um, uh, graphical code, so that when I make the transition over to Android, hopefully it'll be pretty straightforward to implement these interfaces in the Android world by a little a little class that wraps the um, the Android Canvas class and the Android Bitmap class. Um, in this case, yeah, I think this basically. Uh, maybe it doesn't even need this method, so it's just a bitmap is just something you get gets passed around. We could almost use object for that, except obviously we hate that. Um, so yeah, you've got a renderer, you've got this concept of a sprite, which is basically an image that knows where to draw itself. Is that right? Or what, at least where to draw itself relative to the position. Yeah, no, this is an image that knows where to draw itself. So again, that's completely platform independent, it uses that bitmap interface. Um, also, um, things that can uh, uh, change the size of a bitmap 
uh, load up a bitmap from wherever it gets stored on the Android that's in the resources stuff and then a cache which I hope I'll be able to reuse on different platforms that may get complicated I'm not sure but um, this basically just holds on to the last sort of hundred bitmaps you ask to load and throws them away after that because there's too many of them um, uh, which I think is going to be necessary in the Android version because we haven't got a lot of memory um, we also have um, this concept of animations which are basically text files let's see if I can dig one out for you um, so uh, the animations I think are in render So let's have a look at rabbit bashing left first. That should be fairly simple. So an animation is basically the name of a picture followed by the position, the offset that that picture lives at. So this rabbit is bashing to the left. So the, if you can imagine it, the picture of that. It starts off with the rabbit on the right-hand side, and then it moves over to the left as it um, as it bashes. Um, so all those pictures are they're 64 pixels wide, but you want them to start. You want that rabbit to start off in the middle of this square, and then end up one to the left of the square. So we all these pictures need to be offset by 32 um, in order for them to start in the right place and end up in the right place. Whereas if we look at rabbit bashing left, uh, bashing right, he's going to start off um, in, uh, in, on the left of the picture, so that's in the right place already, and just move it to the right. So in this case, uh, the, a, sim a simplification of this file format that I've invented is it's just the name of an image, and if you miss out the coordinates of where it, of the offset, uh, it assumes it's at zero, zero. And then you've got other things where we've got um, animations that reuse uh, whoops, uh, that reuse the same frames multiple times uh, at different offsets, where well, you can do that too. So here there are only two frames for a rabbit falling down, but they're at different vertical positions as it falls. I hope that makes some kind of sense. That might make a little bit more sense if I show you the other little tool I've written, which is an animation tester tool. So here um, we uh, we basically can just set up some animations to play over and over. There's basically three time steps that, um, that are getting animated in this um, uh, in this little UI and we can choose any animations we want to show there. Uh, the animations are made out of images. So if I click, I just clicked in the top left there to say I want an animation to go there. Um, so what animation shall we do? Let's just do a rabbit digging. So now, in the time step where I told it to do it, which was the time step number one, it's playing a little animation of a rabbit digging. And if we want to have a rabbit um, walking to the right, in the, if we put that in the third time step, it should join up with the rabbit that was already walking to the right in the first time step in this square here. So here I've got rabbit walking right in that first time step. And here I added rabbit walking right in the last time step, so that's why they meet up with each other. If I turn that off again, it's gone away. So anyway, the point about that is, um, this is a bit more zoomed in, I can see how the animations are looking in real life. That helps me edit those text files um, with the height offsets and things like that, and helps me just view the animations that I've drawn and make sure that they're coming together okay. Which I guess leads me on to, um, how did I draw these graphics? You will notice that they are uh, pretty rubbish, pretty programmer arty, but um, you know, I made them myself, so uh, I'm hoping someone who can draw will, will join me on this project and uh, we'll have a sort of professional looking game, but in the meantime, uh, you get what I drew. So, the way I've done that is I've drawn each frame in Inkscape. Um, Inkscape is a uh, uh, a drawing program that uses vectors and curves and things rather than pixels but it always has an idea of the size of the image or the kind of default size of the image so I've made I've made images that it that it sees as being 32 
by 32. In fact, this one is 64 by 64 because it spans four squares. The animation spans four squares, so the rabbit starts off down here somewhere. And we're near the end of its process of building a bridge. It's actually the bit where it's just stroking its, stroking its own ear for a little bit of um, a rest at the end of the, the building process. And it's built this much bridge already. Um, but yeah, so I draw them in Inkscape in, in vector drawings, which means that I, I ought to be able to render them at different resolutions. Um, uh, so one of the things you need to do for an Android game is have different resolution images um, for each for different types of devices. So at the moment I'm only rendering them at 32 by 32, but I'm drawing them uh, hopefully in enough detail to render quite a lot higher resolution. And once you've once you've drawn your line drawing in Inkscape, you can do an export as a bitmap, and you can choose the size that you want to um, habitat. So we could we could change this size to to um, to be a high resolution, and because it's a line drawing, it will come out looking relatively nice. Um, but rather than do that manually with every frame, what I do is I, I draw those images in Inkscape, and they, with the the beauty of Make, um, I, I've got a relatively simple Make file, which says basically um, go and look go and look for all the SVG files that you can find in this directory, and then for every SVG file that you find expect to be uh, be creating a PNG file in the uh, in the images 32 directory which is which is for uh, images where one square is 32 pixels wide and at some point we'll have an image of 64 and or whatever else we want um, and then we have this this line here which basically says build all of those PNG files based on the SVG files that you can find and the way you do that is make sure the directory exists that's all that does and then run Inkscape, whoops, and then run Inkscape in its command line mode. How beautiful is this? It's so easy, Inkscape, thank you. Run Inkscape in its command line mode. You see, I start off trying to use um, the um, the tools that you always get with Linux, uh, like the convert tool and things like that. Um, but I actually found that Inkscape uh, does, it, does this as part of its functionality that it gives you. It runs completely on the command line. It just has this little minus minus export PNG. Um, and it creates those, uh, it creates all those PNG files for me. And if I ever create a new SVG file, I just run make, and it automatically creates a PNG file in the right directory for me. Fantastic. Other things I also use make for um, is in, in because of the way Java works. When you're fetching uh, resources, so let's look at when we load an animation. When we load an animation, or when we try and list all the animations. Um, that are available, which we need to do um, in order to be able to. Uh, where do we do that? Um, oh yes, of course. The animation cache wants to know what animations are available so that it can uh, load load them up. Yeah. So the animation cache loads up all the animations and gets them ready for you to use. Um, so anyway, any time we want to list what's in the directory or find out whether something's there, um, when we're loading from within the Java Resources system. Uh, so we're not loading by opening a file, we're loading by saying look for this resource inside, and it might be inside a jar or something like that. Um, there's no concept of listing a directory in that resources system. You can only get so get hold of something if you know uh, the exact path to look for. So what I do is I build these little ls files because I want to be able to list all, everything that's available. Um, so I use make to do that. I actually use the ls command. Uh, so listings. No, this is all quite. Uh, it take a bit of work to get this stuff to run on Windows. Anyway, yeah. So we build the um, we build these LS files. We copy the animation files and the levels files and everything into um, into the Java bin directory, so it's all ready to run. I also have targets that actually uh, run the program with the right class path because that can get annoying. Um, anyway, there's a make file. Uh, okay, so what have we got left? So all the rendering, all the uh, drawing code that um, is not platform specific is in here, and I've tried to make as much as possible not platform specific, including uh, the concept of scaling a bitmap and uh, loading a bitmap and stuff like that. And these are some of these interfaces. But for example, the cache—that's real code in there. We don't have to write that in each uh, for each platform because we've got it written once in here. There's tests for it and stuff. You don't need to be run on your phone, which is all nice. Um, the other thing we've got is we have got a concept of a game loop, 
and a main method. So the the game loop is basically pretty straightforward. You just you can just run the game and then show the show the result of the game. The main method's that got some actual code in here, and what you expect to do is you expect it to over uh, no to extend this class main. It's an it's an abstract class, but it provides some logic in here for you. Um, Based on the the arguments that you pass, it will uh, if you passed if you passed an argument saying load this level file instead of going to the menu, then it will um, it'll load it for you. Then it creates a game loop, and a game loop again is an interface that can be uh, implemented, and it runs it and shows the results. So again, uh, this is an attempt to write this stuff um, in a way that's independent from uh, the platform. Something that I've definitely decided, uh, and I'm completely happy with, is that the actual game loop is going to be completely platform specific. So if you watch the, the last video I did, where I made an Android game loop, um, it draws on, uh, draws images on the screen, possibly some of those concepts should, could be, um, reused in a swing UI, but for example, the text UI, or a UI with some other platform where you don't get to, Run the main loop, or it, it's not allowed to be in its own thread, and or you know it, it works via callbacks or something like that. If it was some kind of OpenGL thing, where OpenGL has its own main uh, main loop and you have to live within it, or anything like that. Basically, um, I decided that a game loop should live in the platform. We shouldn't try and second guess how to do that. I actually think some of this main stuff is a bit of a stretch to try and do in a generic way. Um, you know, a, a bitmap cache and the concept of a bitmap and a, um, a sprite, you know, those are good. A main method, I'm not sure what benefit we get by trying to abstract that out. But anyway, I did. So there's also tests for some uh, some of the parts of this code that um, have actual code in. Um, and f uh, so let's have a quick look at the swing UI and then a very quick look at the text UI. So Let's have a look at the game loop, mainly because it's pretty dumb, because this swing UI, in a way, is just a proof of concept, um, or it's an easy way for me to test out that the game works. Um, I'm not going for enormously high performance here. I mean, I think it's really nice if people can play this game without, if they don't have a phone, or if the game doesn't run on their phone, or uh, they don't want to pay for it, because I want to make it pay for on the Android Store. And then, I mean, I want to stop people from downloading it and building it on their phone. In fact, I'd be very happy if they did that, because hopefully they contribute levels and you know get involved with the development of it. But I also hope that um, people will pay for it if they like it. Um, and an easy way to pay for it, if you like it, is buy it on the Android store when it's on there. Um, anyway, what's my point? Yeah, so isn't it, it's nice if people can, if people haven't got a phone, they can still play the game and contribute to its development. And all the convenience that I get from not having to run stuff on my phone, everyone else who works on it will also get. Um, but at the moment, I haven't looked into making it incredibly high performance because most people's PCs uh, can easily handle uh, a little game like this anyway, so there's no need. I've also, oh, there's a brilliant bug in it. Let me show you. So um, if we if we make the window a bit small, so I've got these wonderful scroll bars, which is all great, you know, it should, it should scroll. But actually, uh, if you try and scroll, that bit of the level doesn't get rendered. I don't know why. It's because I'm I'm using I'm using, I'm not understanding the way Swing renders to a uh, graphics TV and I need to look into it. But the point is, th this um, UI is pretty rough and ready, um, but it's good enough for me to see the game working, which is really what I was going for. I, I'd be very happy if people contributed to make that better, and at some point I'll hopefully make it better myself. Um, anyway, well, that was all just, that was all just me justifying the fact that this main loop is really dumb. So it gets hold of some stuff it needs. It steps the world by one, uh, and then it sleeps, and then, uh, then sorry, then it draws everything, and then it sleeps. Uh, it doesn't do any of that clever stuff we did in the Android one, where it waits just the right amount of time if it needs to, and all that. Um, we could transplant a lot of that logic into here, um, but I haven't, and it works fine. Uh, and then the actual drawing is done on a graphics 2D object, but you'll notice in here this renderer object is the generic renderer, and uh, uh, yeah, the, I think the sprite animator. No, the sprite animator is specific to swing, but the, certainly the bitmap object, bitmap cache, all the stuff that the renderer uses, um, uh, is, is generic. 
Uh, yeah, the animator has to be specific because it gets these swing sprites, not just any old sprites. Um, and provi it provides you a list of sprites to draw. Um, and show result, as, as you saw, was is just a placeholder at the moment that just says you won. But at some point, oh, that should look nicer. Um, what else to show you? So the main method is a standard, uh, basically standard swing, invoke later, saying make the thing. And it makes one of these main methods. So swing main uh, extends this... Um, uh, uh, no, it doesn't extend the main. The main. Something extends main. Um, I've also I've got a very opinionated uh, style of config file which I won't go into, but you're yeah, yeah, welcome to look at. We've got implementations of the the paint interface, which you can see in Swing. The Swing world, you don't actually need a paint, but in the Android world, you do. So it's in there. So we'll probably find I've done that completely wrong. Um, there's all the Swing hoop jumping you have to do. Um, for doing stuff in a background thread and then notifying the other thread and blah blah blah. Um, there's the implementation of the bitmap loader interface, uh, which uses the Java code to actually go and read the object uh, out of the resources, uh, which is basically could be in the jar, could be on the file system. Uh, what else? So that's the main. Uh, uh, the main aspects of the Swing UI, and then the text UI is a bit simpler, uh, especially because the actual text rendering code is all up in Engine because I'm using it for unit tests. So actually, th this is this is bigger than it looks, but um, uh, oh, I know, I know, boy, um, it's bigger than it looks because actually all that text rendering stuff should be in here by rights, but it's in the Engine stuff, so I can use it for. Um, Testing now. I really, well, I, when I got confused about this main method, it's because the actual that main method is actually to do with a single game. So um, the shared code there is is going and finding a level file with that name and loading it. So that's only that only happens when you pass in a file name saying I want to load this level. If you just run um, swing main, let's have a look at that. If you run Swing Main, it, it'll load up your uh, the menus. Not that one, but that one. Oh, it's over here. Look. So uh, yeah, if you go in with a menu, we're not sharing any code between these two, but we are sharing the um, this menu structure. So I showed you near the beginning a menu with a Start Game button, a About button, a Quit button. When you click Start Game, you get the levels, and then you get to choose the levels from in there. If we do the same thing in the text world, which I think is make run menu, yeah, then you can see the same, uh, you've got exactly the same menu based on um, that same specification. You can navigate it in the same way. Um, oops. Uh, yeah, so again, trying to share things between the, the two platforms. It was important to me to use two platforms. Um, uh, I like a text UI, I wanted a swing UI to see what it looks like, obviously all the animations and stuff, you've got to have a graphical UI. I didn't want to make one of those platforms at the beginning Android because you just have to sit around waiting for things a lot. And so um, something that I'm going to have to do eventually is I'm going to have to build all this stuff using the Android build process, which is basically a um, completely different implementation of Java, so I'm likely to find stuff that I've done here that isn't allowed in Android. I obviously won't be able to have any of the swing stuff in that build. Um, what I'm interested in is whether I can, whether those things can coexist. I think quite possibly they won't be able to because the .class files will have a completely different format and they may try and write them to the same place. Maybe I can tell Android Studio to use the same Java, .java files but build into a different um, directory and maybe they can coexist. If they can't coexist I'll have to use a completely separate um, git clone um, of the code for the Android world from the Swing world. Um, and in the Android world, I'll ignore the Swing project. And in the Swing world, I'll ignore the Android project. Um, and the, the, start, the code will be completely compiled by, uh, by the other compiler. And then in the Android world, it'll all get loaded onto the phone to be executed. And in the non-Android world, it'll all execute on this machine, which is nice and fast. So that was the whole point of it. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that it is possible. A little bit more about the text UI. 
let's have a look at the game loop of the text UI. So this is, uh, interestingly, it has basically the same structure. So um, loop, um, go and get the uh, the input that you've been asked, uh, that you want, um, draw the display. No, that's not, so. Um, yeah, so that's a slight wrinkle. You can ignore that. Anyway, draw the display, um, get user input, um, and then, uh, and then loop. That's it. Uh, well, no, step, step the whole world and then loop. So pretty much the same structure as any other a game loop, uh, except we go and get user input and that could wait for as long as you like. Or if we're in a mode where we don't go and get user input, we just loop and we sleep. And then it's really is a lot like another game loop. Um, and you can see the actual printing out of the ASCII art world is done using this text world manip stuff, which is from the engine. And then showing the result is just a matter of printing out your one. So what else to say about all that? So I've shown you the Inkscape um, drawings and how we build um, images from the make file. I've shown you how animations get built up based on all those images. So for example, this animation. So um, let's have a think about whether, how do we get to the renderer? So the renderer gets given these sprites, which are basically a bitmap at a position. Um, it makes sure that those sprites have been scaled to the, the current size because the uh, in, in principle the the size you might zoom in or you might change your window size so that a different tile size is appropriate. But these sprites will also cache the scaled version as part of the kind of contract that they provide. Um, and then we draw the bitmap ba based on the um, position of that sprite. Plus this renderer knows the offset um, of the stuff on the entire screen, so it includes that offset in there. Um, but if we have a look at um, how animations actually get loaded, so this this file, this text file with all these file names in, gets um, turned into a list of frame name and offset. So basically, that's a direct mapping of um, uh, that file format into a name and an offset. And basically, an animation just is just able to get hold of frame number n in the in the animation so the person that uses that is um uh well, that's one person one of the tests uses it but surely someone else uses it uh, oh no sorry yeah and the real code we use an iterator to get through it so in uh in our rendering code um Where's this animation used? Maybe, maybe my search isn't working properly. So we read in the animations. So let's have a look at the swing world and see how this works. So when we're rendering Um, when we're rendering to the world, we're basically the way we get hold of um, the right bitmap to draw is we, we call this get sprites function and we say what frame number we're on. So basically there are 10 frames for every uh, time step. So whereas in most worlds you would do more simulation step, most games you would do more simulation steps than you would render to the screen in order to get the animation, to get the physics accurate. Um, in this game there's only one time step every uh, second or three quarters of a second or something like that. But we want to render a lot more frames than that to make it look nice that they're, they're smoothly jumping from one square to the next. So anyway, the point is, we at any moment it's frame number one, two, three in that list of ten frames that, that fill up a whole time step. So we ask the sprite animator, give me the sprites for this frame number, and the sprite animator loops through all the stuff in the world. So it's got a, a reference to a world. Uh, and it knows it knows all the rabbits in the world, for example. So once once it's got hold of a rabbit, it can, um, and it knows what frame number we're on. So it can go and find the animation for that frame of that thing. So this thing has a state, and the states 
the state is an enum, so state is something like um, rabbit walking to the right. So we get hold of the name, make it lowercase. That gives us back a string telling us which animation we want to load. So we load we load yeah that's it so we get hold an we get hold of an animation so this this variable name looks to me to be wrong this is the animation name from which is got from the state name we ask the cache give me this animation rack once we've got the animation uh <clears throat> That animation is this uh, one of these generic things, and we make a swing animation based on it, and uh, give it a bitmap cache so it can use it can use that cache to go and help get hold of individual bitmaps. So then we ask the animation, give me frame number n. Once we've got that, we've got back a bitmap with its offset. So then we can make a sprite, which is basically the bitmap and the offset and a few other things like where on the screen uh, in squares it is. And then once and then we can return this the this sprite, which then the renderer can use to get the bitmap back out, scale the um, the grid coordinates into actual on-screen coordinates and draw them um, offset by this amount as well. Um, and that's uh, that's how we do rendering. So let's have a little bit more of a look. So basically, what's going on here is that we have a state machine. So in this particular um, square there is a, uh, a thing called an entrance and it knows that if there are any rabbits left every third time step or something like that it makes a rabbit appear, appear here and then all the engine does is it goes through all the objects that exist in the world it says um, uh, step and so that rabbit starting here will then move on to the next square or, or first of all it will set its state to rabbit walking right and then the animation system will, will animate 10 frames of a rabbit moving to the right and then the rabbit will be moved itself to the next square and then the same step will go on again and again. I did actually think about implementing this as a kind of a cellular automaton because uh, in a way it's a similar idea. Everything's on a grid and the current state of the world can be derived by looking at the previous state of the world. I've actually implemented it in a more conventional or Victorian way which was probably sensible. Um, but In principle it could work the other way. Then you can see when I drop in a uh, a tile, uh, uh, well, sorry, when I drop in drop in a token, uh, that uh, puts the rabbit in a certain state, and it put the rabbit there into a state of um, being a, a builder. It built a bridge, and that that bridge building process ended up with a um, uh, a piece of bridge being in the world, a new block being put into the world. And uh, um, the rabbits were then able to get into the exit. So that is the plan. So at the moment we have a game that is um, it has some mechanics. It needs a bit. It needs a few more bits of mechanics before it's any fun, really. This is level one, by the way. Um, similar to Lemmings level one, just dig a classic Lemmings level, and. Uh, so we have the game mechanics working and, and I think it proved at least to my satisfaction that they can be implemented this way and that the animation can be implemented on top of the uh, game engine in this way. Um, and I sort of have a plan for sound effects as well, which is that they're kind of the same thing as animation in a way. Um, uh, we've proved that it can run on two different, completely different user interfaces um, and share most of the code between those two. What we haven't proved is that the actual peculiarities of the Android system uh, will go along with this. Um, so you should wait with bated breath until the video where I explain whether or not that did work. Um, I hope that some of the investment I've done in making the graphics stuff look a bit like Android means that that will be okay. I'm sure I'll hit some wrinkles. and I, I think the first wrinkle that I'm going to hit probably is going to be the um, different Java library versions that are available. I think that might cause me some pain. But anyway, um, uh, next time you see me, I will probably be telling you uh, how it went making this game appear on the screen of my phone. So see you next time.